In this sermon today, we're going to be looking at marriage from 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 to 7. Hear the word of the Lord. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious. For this is how the holy women hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as to the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I pray that you'd use the word of God to give glory to your name. And Lord, I know that many people are struggling in marriages across North America. I pray, O oh Holy Spirit, you'd use your word to teach, to guide, and to correct, to rebuke, all to your glory, so that Christ would be exalted in the marriages of every believer. In Jesus' good name, amen. As we can observe, marriage is not as strong as it once was in North America. And some have said, well, the church has no authority to speak about marriage because the church has failed just as much as marriage in society has. But is this true? An article by Focus on the Family proves otherwise. Now, I've heard this from a lot of people when Christians speak out against inappropriate forms of marriage, people fire back and say, the church, they've done just as bad in marriage, you have no right to speak. Well, not true, according to an article by Focus on the Family. It's one of the most quoted stats by Christian leaders today, and it's perhaps one of the most inaccurate. But based on the best data available, the divorce rate among Christians is significantly lower than the general population. Here's the truth. Many people who seriously practice a traditional religious faith, be it Christian or other, have a divorce rate marked lower than the general population. The factor making the most difference is religious commitment and practice. The, in, the intuitive is true. Couples who regular, regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes, attend church every week, read their Bibles, in spiritual materials regularly, pray uh, privately and together, generally take their faith seriously, living not as perfect disciples, but serious disciples, enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than mere church members, the general public, and unbelievers. Professor Bradley Wright, a sociologist at the University of Connecticut, explains from his anal analysis that people who identify as Christians but rarely attend church have a divorce rate much higher than those who regularly attend church. This comes from the book by R.E. Wright, Christians are hate-filled hypocrites and other lies you've been told. <coughs> One marriage failure in the church is too many. But where can a Christian go to get strong marital advice and even advice on marriage if your spouse is not a Christian and doesn't believe in Jesus Christ? We know that society doesn't care about creating strong marriages, but does Jesus care? Yes, Jesus does care about Christians having strong marriages and Jesus has given us a marital handbook so that we can not only be happy in the Lord, but of course, happy in our marriage. And Jesus has given us his holy word that teaches us and guides us into the truth. And specifically here, the truth about marriage. 
1 Peter chapter 3, 1 to 6 certainly has the potential to be offensive to many in our culture. The word subject or submission is offensive to many because people see authority as something that is absolutely terrible or horrible. As well, the fact that Peter calls uh, the woman here in 3 verse 7 the weaker vessel may upset many from the feminist movement. But we need to clear away the cultural smoke, the cultural nonsense, and see what God is saying to us in this passage, hear it, and then apply it to our hearts, to our lives, to our marriages. Why do we need to do this? Because the Word of God is living and it is active. And as we consider 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 to 7, I also fully recognize that our culture likes to focus on the rights of people, equality and equity. And if that's what all you focus on is equality and equity, you'll find yourself colliding with Jesus and his word. As Christians, we look to Christ who actually gave up his rights and his privileges to die on a cross so that we could have life, that we could have joy. Philippians 2, 6-8, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Furthermore, Jesus calls his people to take up the cross and follow him. Yes, Jesus calls us to a path of lying down our desires, our hopes, and take up new desires and hopes, aspirations and aspirations under the authority of Christ. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So let us approach this passage with humility knowing that if we are claiming that Jesus is Lord, we must actually follow him and obey him as Lord and his word. Before we get into 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, though, someone might wonder why Peter spends six verses on the wives and only one verse on the husbands, 3 verse 7 and 3, 1 to 6 on the wives. Is Peter some kind of misogynist woman hater? No, Peter, of course, is speaking to a cultural situation in the area of Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Peter is addressing women who are in marriage where they are Christian and their husband is not a Christian. This does not mean, though, that if you are a Christian, you go and marry a non-Christian because this situation we find in the Bible, it's not saying that at all. We're given clear commands in the Word of God. If we're a Christian, then we're commanded by God to marry in the Lord, which means we don't marry or even date anybody who is not a Christian. 1 Corinthians 7 verse 39. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes. And you hear that last phrase, only in the Lord. They're to marry, Christians are to marry only in the Lord. Now, there are two scenarios that would have brought about a mixed marriage. Christian with a non-Christian. First, a woman had become a Christian and then she now has a non-Christian husband. And number two, a woman had an arranged marriage with a non-Christian. Peter spends more time instructing women who have non-Christian husbands because it was a concern for the churches that Peter is writing to. Peter is writing to that situation. Now let's look at the passage. We have four points. Three, one, and two, we hear about subjection or submission. 3, verse 3 to 4, we hear about what is sure beauty. What is true and sure beauty? In chapter 3, verse 5 to 6, we have Sarah's example, the godly women in the past. And finally, 3, verse 7, the husband is to show respect and honor to his wife. Let's look at subjection. 3, verse 1 to 2. Likewise, 
Wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Peter gives this command that wives be subject to their own husband. To be subject means to be in submission. It means that you respect the authority of someone. This means that the husband is the spiritual authority, the leader in the home. And with that responsibility, of course, of, of being the spiritual authority, come, has, there are other great responsibilities for the husband. And we'll get to that in chapter 3, verse 7. As I've mentioned before, when I was in school, the Bible was read every morning before classes started. A fellow classmate of mine read Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 to 33, which is actually what we call a parallel passage and teaches very similar things that, is, that we see in 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 to 7. One of my teachers, who was certainly not Christian, could not believe that such a passage was in the Bible, and they were banned from reading any passage like it in the early morning assembly ever again. Other people do not like this passage because they feel it promotes the abuse of women in marriage. Now, I remember a minister being upset with wives subject to your husband passages because he knew a guy who knew a guy who knew a guy who was beating his wife and she was not submitting. In response, just because we have an abusive person misusing scripture to justify violence and stupidity, this does not mean that we disregard God's word. In spite of the two experiences I've mentioned above, the Lord gives us clear direction to wives in that they are to be subject to their husbands. Paul teaches about wives being subject to their husbands in actually three other passages in the New Testament. Ephesians 5.22 Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Colossians 3.18, wives submit to your husbands as it is fitting in the Lord. In Titus 2.5, be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. As we see in these three other passages on wives being submissive to their husbands, this submission is to be done as to the Lord. This submission is fitting to the Lord and wiser to submit so that the word of God is not reviled or maligned so that they show that they're obedient to the word of God. But what if a Christian wife does not have a Christian husband? What is her responsibility then to her husband? And Peter lays out this very scenario that they must also be subject or be in submission to their husbands. Now, this does not mean absolute submission. Because if their husband requests something that goes against their conscience as a Christian, they are to, of course, fear the Lord first. The Lord is to be feared first and foremost in every Christian's heart and life. But we also need to see the reason for this submission to their husband, who does not know the Lord. The reason is so that the husbands who do not obey the word might be won over to the Lord, not even by words, but by the actions of the spouse. We need to be reminded again that our actions matter. How we live our lives matters, not only to the Lord, but to the world who is watching. I need to be clear though, do not marry someone or date someone with the hopes that you will win them over by your submission. This command does not refer to that, it refers to spouses, for whatever reason, have a non-Christian husband. The wife of a non-Christian husband needs to see their married life as a mission field as she follows Jesus in her marriage. And let's go to verse 2, what kind of conduct are we going to see here? Do you see what these non-Christian husbands will observe? Two things. Respectful conduct or fearful conduct or impure conduct. 
respectful conduct. Now, this phrase, respectful conduct, is actually the word fear. And it refers to fearing the Lord. You will live out a life that fears the Lord. In fact, the New International Reader's Version says, uh, a full respect for God for respectful conduct. And the New Living Translation for respectful conduct translates this as reverent lives. The Christian wife is to live a life in fear or in awe of the Lord. This means that you live your life in reverence to God, in fear and adoration. This means that you turn away from evil and you do good, just like Job did. And you obey the Lord all to the glory of the Lord. And next, pure conduct. Pure conduct refers to living a holy life. A holy life that hates sin, flees from sin, and pursues Jesus Christ. And Peter has already talked a lot about holiness in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 to 16. But he who has called you is holy. God is holy. And he's called you. You be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. So we have this subjection, point one. Point two, verses three to four, sheer, sheer beauty. Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. Peter's teaching on beauty is something now very counter-cultural. In North America, culture sees, of course, something, beauty as something that is always external. You don't have to watch too much TV to see that external beauty is something very important to our North American culture. Well, guess what? It was the same back then when Peter wrote this letter of 1 Peter. The practices that Peter is addressing here is expensive hairdos, expensive jewelry, and expensive clothes. Doesn't that sound familiar? Things haven't changed that much in the last 2,000 years, have they? But Peter says... That how women adorn themselves on the outside is not at all important in comparison to how a woman adorns herself on the inside. And then we get to verse 4. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is in God's sight very precious. Society sees outward beauty as extremely precious. But God sees the inward beauty of a quiet and gentle spirit as very precious. Do you see the word but there? This but is a sharp contrast to the outward appearance versus the inward adornment. We know that what we often see is not real or genuine. We also know that the Lord said that he looks at a person not as humans look at a person, Humans look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We see this in the story of David as Samuel is going to choose a new king. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as a man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Peter calls women not to show off with ritzy clothing, clothing, but to adorn themselves with a righteous spirit. Peter calls them to have a gentle and quiet spirit. Society preaches that women need to focus on how they look, but the Lord calls women to a higher calling to live humble lives and quiet lives before the Lord. When was the last time that you saw a commercial focused on humility? compared to a commercial that focused on taking care of outward appearance. I'm guessing you've never seen a commercial that called you to focus on a godly character, but you have seen thousands of commercials that promote an outward appearance in women. Let's go to this next point, Sarah's example in verses 5 to 6. Verse 5, For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Peter uses the example of women in the past. This is how the holy women 
in the past conducted themselves. First, they hoped in God. They had the gift of eternal life and they looked forward to that day when they would be in the full presence of God. These women were not living for the here and now, for pleasure in the moment, living in the moment of how beautiful they were. They were hoping in the Lord. Next, they submitted to their husbands. They weren't worried about their rights and privileges. They hoped in God and respected the leadership of their husband. In our culture, when society says someone is beautiful, the last thing you're thinking about is a quiet and humble woman. But the Lord looks at the heart. And let's get to this final verse, verse 6 in this section. As Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Peter uses this example of Sarah and Abraham. Peter is actually quoting from Genesis 18 verse 12. This is in the context where Sarah has just heard that she is going to bear a child in an old age and she just cannot believe it. She laughs. What does she say? And Sarah laughed to herself saying, After I am worn out and my Lord is old, shall I have pleasure? She calls Abraham Lord, which doesn't make her a servant of Abraham, but shows that Sarah is respecting Abraham as her husband. The Christian women who do good in their marriage and seek to live the lives of holiness will be children of Sarah. They'll belong to the faithful line of women who hoped in the Lord and trusted in the Lord. But note what else Peter says about these married Christian women. They're not to fear anything that is frightening. Maybe some women were in less than ideal marriages, and this would have been a challenge and a stress. They're not to fear the situations that they're in, but they're to hope in God and, of course, fear the Lord instead. There's something freeing about not being beaten down by situations and then hoping the Lord and fearing the Lord. It's a freeing thing. And let's get to this last point, point number seven, showing honor where Peter focuses on husbands. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Now, Peter goes on to address the husbands here. And as you can see, the husband is commanded to be understanding with his wife. Peter calls Christians as well to be considerate with their wives and respectful of their wives. This leaves no room for abuse of the example that we had before, that the wife is, wasn't submitting according to his likeness, and he was beating his wife. Probably alcohol was involved in that situation as well. But this passage right here, you have to take the full thing in context. That would never equate living in an understanding way and showing honor to your spouse. But Peter does say something here. He calls the woman the weaker vessel. Now, calling uh, a woman a weaker vessel can get you into a lot of trouble in this culture. And even defining a woman uh, properly, according to the Bible, will get you in a ton of trouble. And some have used this phrase to claim that women are weaker emotionally, intellectually, even spiritually. But Peter doesn't have any of this in his, in his mind. And we know that it cannot mean that the wife is the lesser person because Peter in the next phrase says, women and husbands or husbands and wives are co-heirs in the grace of life. There's a quality. They're heirs together in the gospel, in the salvation of Jesus Christ. But what Peter is saying is that the women are the weaker vessel because they're weaker physically, which you see in sports, which you see in weightlifting competitions, stuff like that. He says, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. Peter makes clear to us all that there is complete equality between wives and husbands. The wife and the husband are co-heirs in the grace of life. The grace of life, of course, refers to the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. Both the Christian husband and wife share in this blessing of knowing the gift of life in Jesus Christ. Peter describes this gift of life in chapter 1 of 1 Peter in verses 3 to 5. 
Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. The husband and wife who are Christian experience this blessed hope together. They know the great mercy of God that is given to them by Jesus Christ. They know the living hope of eternal life through the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. They know that God is guarding them and keeping them in his grace until his second coming. And this grace, this gift of life, or grace of life, literally how the Greek reads, should fuel your marriage and your life together. If a spouse sins, you might want to retaliate, but instead, show mercy to them as Christ has shown mercy to you. Christian, in your marriage, allow the person and work of Christ to fuel your relationship. When you sin against your spouse, <clears throat> seek the mercy of Christ. When your spouse sins against you, seek the mercy of Christ. And do you see this last phrase about prayer? First, we need to highlight that families and marriages, we see this, of course, we're to pray with one another as a family, as a marriage, as a couple. And you ought to be couples and families who are devoted to prayer. But we also see if we're not living in obedience to Jesus Christ in our marriage, our prayers will be hindered. When there's disunity in a marriage, there will likely be no unity in the Lord in that marriage. And because of this disunity, the prayers of the husband and wife will be hindered. Well, how does this passage apply to our hearts and lives? First, I want to focus on the heirs of the grace of life. Even in this controversial passage on marriage, we see the gospel laid out. Peter speaks about the gift of life which is given to the Christian, which is the gospel. Also, the very act of marriage laid out in other passages in the Bible preach the gospel to us. For, instan for instance, Ephesians 5 helps us out. Ephesians 5, 22-27 Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that he might be holy and without blemish. Do you see how the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ helps us understand the beauty of God's design for marriage? Jesus loved his church. Jesus loves you, and we know that he loves us simply by how he acts and responds to us. He gives up his life for us. Jesus laid down his life on the cross. Jesus took the punishment of sin in our place so that we might be reconciled or restored to God. Our sins are washed away and we're declared pure and blameless before the Lord. And what a wonderful joy to be the heir of the hope of of eternal life. Today though, if you're outside the Lord Jesus Christ and have not experienced this gift of life in the person of Jesus Christ, see that your sin has separated you from God. And that has brought death because sin brings death. See the beauty of the sacrifice of the work of Christ and come to Jesus today. Leave your sin. It's not going to bring you any joy. It's not a gift. Sin is not a gift. But the gift of life is an amazing gift, an eternal gift. Trust Christ in what he's accomplished for you. And if you're a Christian and married, you never outgrow the grace of Jesus Christ that is needed daily. I remember a great sermon that was preached at a wedding years ago that made the gospel clear. The preacher declared that both the bride and the groom were sinners, and these two sinners were joining in marriage. He proclaimed that they were going to need the grace of God daily and they still do husbands and wives you will always need the grace of christ to forgive and be forgiven next god's command to wives there are two types of women addressed here 
the wife with a Christian husband, you're commanded to respect the authority of your husband. This is where God has placed you. And the wife with the non-Christian husband, you're commanded to respect the leadership of your husband. But live a holy life. Live a quiet life. Live a life that declares the greatness of Jesus. Pray for your husband and ask God to save him. Pray that your life would declare the greatness of Jesus to him. And finally, God's command to husbands Husbands, you're commanded by God to be understanding and honor your wife. Let us do that because you are both heirs of the gift of life, the gospel. Paul also talks about this responsibility of husbands in Colossians 3.19. Husbands, love your wives and don't be harsh with them. Be understanding, be compassionate, be kind, be respectful. As the Lord has loved us, we are commanded to love our spouse Let us do this all to the glory of the Lord. And thanks for watching, and God bless.